Good morning, everybody. I'm Lizzie Reiser in for Savannah Sellers. Good to have you with us on this Monday. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a community in shock. This morning, a suspected gunman is dead after police say he shot and killed 10 people at a dance studio in Monterey Park, California over the weekend. All of this playing out as they gather to celebrate the Lunar New Year. It's very surprising, shocking to hear that something like this went on in not only a small city, but my city. We'll have the latest from the scene as investigators try to figure out a motive, plus the impact this mass shooting is having on the Asian American community during what is supposed to be a time of celebration. Another discovery. Justice Department officials find more classified items at Pres President Biden's Delaware home. And we're learning some of those documents date back to his time in the Senate and as vice president. This morning, what we know about the search and how this new discovery could intensify the president's political headaches. From lawyer to defendant, jury selection begins today in the case of high profile lawyer Alec Murdoch, accused of killing his wife and son. Cases gained national attention and led to multiple investigations. How it could all play out in a courtroom. Also this morning, Surf's Up, one of the world's biggest surfing contests, is back, and this time it's making history. For the first time, female surfers will be competing alongside men in the Eddy contest. We'll take a look at the steps that women had to take to get included in the competition. Those are some big waves. My understanding is they haven't had this for like six or seven years because the conditions have to be just so oh, wow. perfect for this competition. So we'll chat with them yeah, a little bit later. Looking forward to that. We're going to begin, though, of course, this morning with new developments in the mass shooting at a Lunar New Year celebration on Saturday night. It happened in Monterey Park, California. Ten people were killed. And police say the suspected gunman, a man in his 70s, is dead. They say they found him in a van yesterday following an hours-long man hunt dead from what appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound and we're learning the shooting in monterey park could be linked to another incident in alhambra that happened about 20 minutes later authorities say a man described as asian entered another dance hall there with a firearm but people at that location were able to disarm him and he fled in a white van last night president biden ordered all flags on federal government property to be flown at half staff to honor the victims We'll have more on the investigation and how the Asian American Pacific Islander community is reacting to this latest tragedy. But we are going to start with NBC News senior national correspondent and News Now anchor Kate Snow with the latest developments in the investigation. Saturday night's mass shooting has become one of the worst in modern history here in the Los Angeles area. Ten people dead, at least ten people injured. The 72-year-old suspected gunman was found dead 12 hours after all this started. And now this tight community is reeling and just beginning to process this tragedy. The man authorities believe is responsible for killing 10 people at a ballroom dance hall is no longer a threat. Investigators say 72-year-old Hu Can Tran opened fire inside that crowded ballroom in Monterey Park after 10 p.m. on Saturday. Additional units requested multiple victims, gunshot wounds. Five men and five women were killed and 10 others wounded. Witnesses inside described the confusing chaos, initially mistaking the gunfire for celebratory fireworks. Outside, emergency crews treated the wounded in a nearby parking lot and transported others to area hospitals. It happened in one of the largest Asian American communities in the country, about seven miles east of downtown Los Angeles. Earlier Saturday, thousands were at a festival to celebrate the Lunar New Year, including Amber Clements. You were a few blocks away, and what did you hear? Like, it was like six continuous, like, shots. Tran had been a familiar face at the Star Ballroom Dance Studio in Monterey Park, though it's unclear how often he visited recently, three people who knew him told CNN. While investigators have not yet determined a motive, they say this may not have been the gunman's only target. Just 20 minutes after fleeing the first scene, the armed shooter went to a different ballroom dance hall. The sheriff says two people inside wrestled the weapon away from him, and he ran. He was disarmed. Uh, by two community members who I consider to be heroes because they saved lives. It took more than 12 hours for officers to locate the elderly suspect inside this white van about 30 miles away from the crime scene. Tactical teams breaking through the van's windows, finding the suspect behind the wheel with a fatal self-inflicted gunshot wound. Overnight, authorities carrying out a search warrant of the suspect's home, the shooting leaving his neighbors shocked. Well, he's kept to himself. You just don't know day to day what, who's who and what's what. 
Authorities trying to reassure the community there is no threat anymore. You are no longer in danger because this shooter is gone. But the aftershocks are still being felt. I tried to reach them, I didn't get any answers. This woman was searching for a friend who had visited the ballroom before, worried she may be one of the victims. Ten lives ended while out to celebrate a new beginning. They are family to us. We've known some of them have been here for 30 years. Investigators say they found a handgun inside that white van and that they recovered a semi-automatic assault pistol at that second ballroom location, the gun that was taken away from the suspected gunman. That, by the way, is not legal to own or have here in the state of California. Authorities also believe the license plates on that white van may have been stolen, and investigators are saying it may take months to figure out exactly what happened here on Saturday night. Back to you. Kate, thank you. Let's bring in NBC News terrorism contributor and analyst and retired ATF special agent in charge, Jim Cavanaugh. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. So in cases like this where the motive is still a mystery and the suspect is dead, what is it investigators are going to be focusing on right now? What are the main clues they're looking for? Well, of course, motive, like you said, Joe, the why, why did it happen? Secondly, they're going to want to go in and see if you know, anybody helped him by supplying the weapon to him. Uh, it's illegal in California to have that kind of assault pistol. Did someone, you know, sell it to him illegally on the black market? Did someone help him buy it in another state at a gun show? Did he travel to another state and use a different ID to purchase it at a gun shop or somehow? Did he finagle the system? So that's going to be key. You know, that's the reason for that is to help stop a future one or you know, have some other change that could stop uh, a like and similar act. So they're going to want to get inside his head, not for prosecution, but, you know, to help us in the future. So those are two of the main things. Is there any Confederates that helped him criminally supplying the weapon or encouraging him? Is there any writings he has or, you know, computer postings he has that tells the motivation of the case? Uh, that's generally because he's dead, so there's no prosecution going to happen. So, Jim, you know, investigators describe the suspect as an Asian male. Does that take the question of a hate crime off the table, or is that still a possibility if the investigation uncovers more? Well, technically, it does not, because the hate crime law does not describe who you are. It's all about who you attack. Uh, for example, you could attack someone and think they're uh, Hispanic, and they're not Hispanic. It's still a hate crime, because it's about your motivation. And there's nothing to prohibit that, but it's extremely unusual and rarely ever happens, and it will, would not happen normally, because the prosecutors would have such a high burden of proof to prove that someone of the same ethnic uh, denomination killed you know, other, others just like him, motivated by hate. And so more likely than not, I mean, that's off the table. Of course, we are not going to have a prosecution anyway. But uh, the motivation here, Joe, um, in my analysis, boils down to only two things, and that's probably revenge. It could be a little bit power. Regardless By, of... When you... Oh, go ahead, Jim. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I was saying, when we, when we know now that Mr. Tran was a, was a patron at these two dance clubs, we know he had contact there. Uh, he goes back, to, uh, kills at one, and wants to kill at the other one. This uh, speaks more to a motive of revenge. In his mind, he wants to attack some people there, maybe because he was ostracized, uh, he was pushed out, he didn't feel a part of the group. That doesn't mean he was. That doesn't mean that they did anything to him. It means his perception of the way the world around him was. So he wants to get back at those around him. They may, they're just like him. He's an Asian American as well. But that's not the, the motivation I don't think here. He's not out to kill Asian people. I think he's out to re seek revenge, most likely, on people who he felt have uh, had more success than him in life, mm -hmm, have right. ostracized him, you know, something like that. All right, Jim Cavanaugh, thanks so much for your expertise this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks, Cynthia Che, co-founder of the Stop Asian American Pacific Islander Hate Organization, joins us now. Cynthia, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being with us. We know Monterey Park has been called the country's first suburban Chinatown or ethnoburb because the community has held true to its roots over the years. How does the community move forward and heal, especially during this time that should be festive and celebratory? 
Yes, as you noted, this this is typically traditionally a, a joyous celebratory celebratory time where families and communities gather, and of course, uh, this time has been marred by this tragedy. Um, I'm very familiar with this community. I, we've had many fa family gatherings there, and it's truly devastating, especially coming off uh, several years. Of, of being fearful, being out in public. Um, we've documented the rise in anti-Asian hate and violence. And of course, um, you know, of course, the Asian American community wondered about whether or not this attack uh, be racially motivated. Yeah, while it is still early in the investigation and the exact motive is not clear, you, you just mentioned um, we know that there has been a really glaring increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans, even as they continue to be really one of the most largest growing ethnic population in the country. What role is your organization likely to play in this case? Well, since um, the devastating news, uh, we have been working with our partners. Um, one of our uh, partners, with Stop API Hate, is based in um, and serving the LA County area. And so, first and foremost, we are thinking about the victims, the survivors, and, and the local community, Monterey Park. And it's extremely important that we talk about um, victim services, um, how we ensure that we support efforts uh, to heal, to really think. I mean, one of the things we do know is that in a, in a tragedy of this nature, uh, it has a long tail. And uh, we are talking and coordinating efforts uh, to deal with this trauma um, and supporting this healing efforts that are going to be so critical in the days, months, and even years ahead. Cynthia Che, I'm sorry we're speaking under these circumstances, but thanks for being with us. Thank and you. NBC News will be continuing our coverage tonight. Nightly News anchor Lester Holt will be live from Monterey Park, California, with the latest on the mass shooting that followed those Lunar New Year celebrations. This morning, there's growing pressure on President Biden. More classified items were found at his Delaware home following a 13-hour search by the FBI on Friday. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has the latest from Washington. Kelly, good morning. Good morning, Joe. The White House has been unable to provide a specific description of the total items removed in these searches. How many pages, what kinds of documents are involved, and what level of classification are we dealing with? But they do emphasize the president is fully cooperating and invited the Department of Justice to go room by room through his house. New questions about more secret government papers found inside the Biden's Delaware home after a stunning weekend announcement that the FBI spent 13 hours Friday pouring over the private residence of the sitting president, a rare step the White House called voluntary and not the result of a search warrant. He's not res resisting an investigation. He's not stonewalling. He's offering total cooperation with the Justice Department as this proceeds. In a statement, the president's personal lawyer explained the Department of Justice removed six items consisting of documents with classification markings and surrounding materials, dating back to Mr. Biden's service in the Senate and as vice president. Friday's search marks the fifth time since November that sensitive materials were discovered at a location tied to the president. On Thursday, in California, before this search, the president spoke about the investigation. I think you're going to find there's nothing there. I have no regrets. I'm following what the lawyers have told me they want me to do. It's exactly what we're doing. There's no there there. But some Democrats urged the president to acknowledge mistakes were made. You just might as well say, listen, it's irresponsible. It was something that we should have had a better check and balance on. While House Republicans with oversight powers turn up pressure. The special counsel is going to have to deal with the issue of what was the chain of custody? Who had these? Why did he take them to begin with? 
And as the president is dealing with both the political and the legal issues involved in the documents case, he's going to be looking to some new leadership inside the White House. In the coming weeks, the president is expected to name a new chief of staff, and that's the most powerful role on his team. Jeff Zients, who you may recall that name, he served as the COVID response coordinator early on in the administration. He'll return as chief of staff, according to multiple sources. And Ron Klain, who's been a longtime Biden loyalist, is expected to continue to support the president, but from the outside as 2024 heats up. The president will be returning from his Rehoboth Beach House in Delaware early this afternoon. That is not the same address as the search that was carried out on Friday. He and the first lady uh, were at the Rehoboth home and were not present when the FBI searched the home in Delaware in Wilmington on Friday. Joe? All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Several people have been arrested after a protest in downtown Atlanta turned violent Saturday night. Demonstrators had gathered to oppose this development of the City of Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, or what they call Cop City. They were also there to protest the killing of an activist who was fatally shot by law enforcement last week. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta with more on this. So, Blaine, there have been protests, weeks of protests, really, around this. We really saw it escalate, though, over the weekend. What happened? Yeah, this happened on, on Saturday when we kind of saw this come to a, a kind of a crescendo, really. Uh, there was a police car that was set on fire and was burning for some time downtown. Uh, also, the building that houses the Atlanta Police Foundation, which has given money to this uh, training facility development, was vandalized. We saw windows smashed. Uh, allegedly, some fireworks were set off, and there was graffiti also painted in the area. Now, as you said, this isn't new. This issue isn't new. In fact, there have been at least uh, several weeks, maybe a couple of months of protests around what uh, they're calling Cop City. It's a very large development that's going to be a training facility for uh, police officers here in Atlanta. But all of this, of course, this escalation that we saw over the weekend, Lindsay, comes on the heels of a man who was protesting this very same thing being shot and killed earlier in the week. Where do we stand on that investigation? So as of right now, we do know that that person was shot and killed. But according to the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation that's been brought in to lead this investigation, they say that that man actually opened fire on officers first, injuring a Georgia State Patrol trooper. Now, the GBI also says that there is no body camera video of this incident at all. Uh, but they do say that they are continuing to look into this, but made the point that it was the man who was shot and killed who opened fire first, according to the GBI. And Blaine, we're also keeping an eye on a situation out of Memphis where police are also under pressure over the killing of a 29-year-old mot motorist. What's the latest there? Yeah, his name was Tyree Nichols, and this was after uh, a traffic stop that happened a couple of weeks ago. Police put out a statement and said that uh, Nichols was involved in what they're calling two confrontations with police officers. Now, those confrontations ended up with him in the hospital. Uh, his stepfather released a rather graphic photo that showed him appearing to be bloodied and with what appears to be a swollen eye. He died some, a short time thereafter. Now, five police officers who were involved in that traffic stop have been dismissed from the department. They've been fired. The department says that they violated a number of department policies. Now, the DOJ, the FBI have opened a civil rights investigation into all of this. Now, Lindsay, there have been a number of calls for the city to release whatever video exists of that stop, whether it's body cam, dash cam video. The city says that they will do just that after an investigation and after the family has had a chance to review that video. Lindsay. Okay. Blaine, thank you. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather. Angie Lassman's back with us. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. A little bit of a soggy start for places like New York and Washington this morning and up into Boston. Uh, some snow, though, that we're dealing with for the interior areas of the Northeast. This is a system that's exiting. It's moving out into the Atlantic. We're not going to have to worry about it much longer after today. We'll see still the lingering rain and snow that we'll deal with, hence the reason why 14 million people still are under those winter weather alerts. In the bright pink, that winter storm warning. In the white, you see the winter weather advisory. So we'll add on a couple inches of snow for some folks, especially in the higher elevations of Vermont and New Hampshire and maybe even Maine through the day. Today, we could see uh, isolated amounts up to five inches. So adding some of that snow for places like Boston as well, looking at about an inch through the rest of the day today. Then we turn our attention to our next storm system. And this one is going to basically impact most of the eastern half of the United States. Uh, but we're looking ahead to tomorrow where we will have that severe threat, mainly focused down through, through the Gulf Coast. 
You can see places like Louisiana, Mississippi, as well as Alabama and the panhandle of Florida are included in that highest risk area where 8 million people will see the potential for some gusty winds, a few strong tornadoes, and even some damaging hail. This is what we'll watch into the afternoon hours. But additionally, the system is going to bring snow and rain for people elsewhere. So here's how it plays out, taking you through the next couple of days. There's that system. It dips south of New Mexico, eventually uh, bringing snow to places like Texas and Oklahoma. It'll be a little bit of a snowy kind of day for them tomorrow. Also dealing with the rain and, of course, that severe weather threat that I mentioned. This rain and snow will eventually move to the northeast as the system crawls to the northeast as well. And you can see spreads snow over parts of the Midwest, rain along the east coast of the United States, from Jacksonville up through Charleston and Washington, D.C. and New York. Look like we'll deal with some rainy conditions on Wednesday. So we'll have one dry day if you're in those places like New York. We'll have a dry day tomorrow, but then Wednesday the rain works back in with this next system. How about the snow? No snow for folks in, in New York just yet, but instead we'll see again the interior areas of the Northeast getting in on some more of that snow fall. Here's the uh, latest winter weather alerts for that system, including parts of the midsection of the country extending from Michigan all the way into parts of Texas and New Mexico. That is where again we will see that snow falling tomorrow. Those accumulations will come in anywhere from one to two inches, maybe up to four inches for some isolated amounts there. We'll see some higher amounts up into parts of New York, upstate New York and Vermont, New Hampshire and Maine that inch closer to about six to eight inches. So we'll see a good amount of snow in some locations. How about the rain? Could be some impressive rainfall rates uh, anywhere from an inch or so, an hour. So we'll watch for some localized flooding. We're not looking at a big flood threat through the day tomorrow and into Thursday, but we will keep a close eye on that. Temperature wise, we're way below normal for the western, at least the southwest. Uh, 10 degrees below normal in Santa Fe as they reach a high of just 35 degrees today. 50 for Tucson. That's almost 20 degrees below normal for this time of year. The east is a different story. A little warmer than normal for this time of year. Into the 40s for Philadelphia. Low 70s for New Orleans. But that doesn't last for long. We'll see that cool air start to spread to the east as that system works through over the rest of the week. And temperatures will eventually end up into the 40s for places like New York, guys. Okay, Angie, thank you. Today, jury selection is set to begin in the double murder trial of former South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch. He was indicted on two counts of murder, accused of shooting and killing his wife and son. Since being charged, Murdoch has denied murdering his family members. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck joins us now from Walterboro, South Carolina, with the latest. Katie, good morning to you. So what can we expect from the proceedings today? Well, good morning, Joe. This is just the start of what will likely be a month-long trial here in Walterboro. Today starts jury selection, and 900 people uh, were actually potential jurors in this case. In this tiny town, Walterboro has about 5,000 people. The county has about 40,000 people, but they are going to have a really difficult time seating this jury because Murdoch is a household name here in Low Country, South Carolina. Very few people are not familiar with this family. They had a legal dynasty stretching back decades. Uh, many powerful Murdochs sat in high positions of authority inside courthouses. In fact, there was actually a picture of a Murdoch in the back of the courtroom where this proceeding will occur. They actually had to take that down uh, before the start of the trial. So there is a great deal of pressure right now to find an impartial jury and seat that jury. Will it happen this week? Likely not. We're told it's going to take the entire week uh, to seat the jury. They're potentially going to hear a couple of motions and then the real trial, the, the argument Arguments will start next week. So, Katie, in addition to the murder charges, Murdoch is facing dozens of other charges. What more can you tell us about those? This is a twisted tale. It is not a story. It's a, a saga. Uh, there are so many charges and allegations wrapped up uh, surrounding this one man, Alec Murdoch. Uh, the financial crimes he's faced with alone, almost 90 different charges of fraud and embezzlement, uh, stealing millions of dollars from his own family law firm and then from clients, from settlements, uh, and, and doing so sort of for a long time under the radar. Uh, and then all of a sudden, this, this sort of onion has started to unravel and there are all of these allegations including obviously the murder of his son and his wife at their at their hunting property which is not but five miles from where we're standing right now katie people where you are they haven't seen this much media attention in the area since the filming of forrest gump back in 1994 obviously this a very different situation but but how are people there reacting to this upcoming trial 
Well, I think uh, national media, international media has descended here. It is certainly a, a, an overwhelming media presence and will be for the next month. Uh, the director of tourism in this small town is choosing to embrace the attention, and he has got food trucks that he has brought into the square around the courthouse to try and provide some dining options for out-of-towners. He's kind of taking this as we may have a, a one-time shot to reach the national spotlight. We should leave a fond impression on our friends from the from the media. So. Um, the, the accommodations they are providing, trying to find workspaces for folks, uh, trying to bring in food trucks, making sure all of the hotels have have room. Uh, they're they're trying their best uh, to put their best foot forward because they know uh, this will probably be a pretty rare occurrence to have all of these people here at the same time. All right, Katie Beck, thank you so much, Katie. Questions are being raised about an elementary school in Newport News, Virginia. This after a new report alleges that school officials were warned multiple times about a student's behavior before police say the six-year-old child intentionally shot his teacher. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us with more on that story. Good morning. Good morning, guys. That first grade teacher is now out of the hospital and recovering from her injuries. But there are growing concerns this morning about the lead up to the shooting with allegations that the teacher had repeatedly asked school administrators for help with the troubled student. This morning, there are new questions surrounding Rich Neck Elementary, with staffers alleging that Virginia school may have downplayed multiple warnings about the six-year-old who shot his teacher, 25-year-old Abigail Werner, inside a classroom earlier this month. According to screenshots of a conversation between school employees and the superintendent, obtained by the Washington Post but not independently verified by NBC News, Zwerner raised alarms about the six-year-old and sought assistance during the school year. Staffers writing in the chat messages like, she had asked for help several times two hours prior and all year. The Post says the messages do not detail what specific assistance Werner sought or to whom she directed her requests. In a separate message obtained by the Post but not seen by NBC News, a rich neck teacher also says that school officials waved away grave concerns about the six-year-old's conduct, including one incident when he allegedly wrote a note telling a teacher he hated her and wanted to light her on fire and watch her die. That teacher said they told school officials about the note, but was allegedly told to drop the matter. According to the employee's account in the Post, the student wasn't getting the educational services he needed and sometimes wandered the school unsupervised. The boy's family speaking out for the first time Thursday, saying in a statement that their son suffers from an acute disability and was under a care plan that included his mother or father attending school with him and accompanying him to class every day. The week of the shooting, they say, was the first time they were not with him in class, adding, we will regret our absence on this day for the rest of our lives. The new allegations against Richneck only echoing the concerns of so many frustrated teachers and parents at a packed school board meeting last week. I asked for help and was given none at both the school level and at the district level. I cried daily. Listen to your teachers when they have concerns, please. Listen to them. NBC News reached out to Zwerner, the boy's family, and the school for comment on the allegations, but we have not heard back. The Washington Post says a school district spokesperson declined to share any information about the boy's educational record, citing a federal law protecting students' privacy. As for the superintendent, that person has said that they are working on improving overall safety, including adding new metal detectors at schools. Meanwhile, Rich Neck will remain closed for students for the rest of the week. No word yet on when it's going to reopen, guys. Metal detectors. All right, Stephanie, mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome. Welcome back. Family and friends of Lisa Marie Presley gathered at Graceland on Sunday to honor her memory in a public memorial service. Lisa Marie has been buried alongside her son and father, Elvis Presley, on the Graceland property. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us now from Memphis. Priscilla, good morning. Lindsay, Joe, good morning. It was an emotional day here at Graceland yesterday as family, friends, and fans said a final goodbye to Lisa Marie Presley. And we also learned more about what Lisa Marie wanted for her memorial service, including one very important request, don't make it sad. A powerful memorial fit for rock and roll royalty. Heartfelt musical tributes from friends Axl Rose. I just end up walking in the cold November And Alanis Morissette. God, rest our souls. 
Lisa Marie Presley, the only daughter of Elvis, was honored on Sunday at her father's historic Memphis mansion, Graceland. Family, friends, and thousands of mourners poured into the estate to pay tribute. Everyone here feels like they're part of this family. A letter from Lisa Marie's oldest daughter, Riley, read by her husband. We are you, you are us, my eternal love. I hope you finally know how loved you were here. The Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, quoting the late Queen Elizabeth. My late uh, mother-in-law used to say that grief is the price we pay for love. And how right she was. The 54-year-old singer-songwriter died January 12th after suffering a cardiac arrest. Born into the spotlight and into a family with a history of heartbreak. Her father's death when she was just nine years old. Her son, Ben, dying by suicide in 2020. That hurt, still raw, as revealed in a poem by one of Lisa Marie's daughters, read by Priscilla. I knew it was close to the end. Survivors, guilt, some would say, but a broken heart was the doing of her death. Now she is home where she always belonged. Lisa Marie's final resting place? next to her son in the meditation garden along with her father Elvis at Graceland a place where she told today in 2018 she feels most grounded I'm connected to something here more than anywhere else after a life filled with so much pain finding her eternal rest And among the thousands in attendance for the service on Sunday was the director of the new film Elvis and the, the movie's star, Austin Butler, who pay, played Lisa Marie's iconic father. And this was a movie that Lisa Marie was very proud of and worked tirelessly to promote. And now with the Oscar nomination set for tomorrow, the Presley legacy is now in the hands of Lisa Marie's three daughters who are set to inherit Graceland. Joe, Lindsay. All right, Priscilla Thompson, thank you. Now to headlines from around the world, starting in Somalia, where at least five people are dead after extremists stormed a government office. Claudia Lavanga joins us now from Rome. With that and more, Claudia, good morning. Good morning. Yes, the government in Somalia said that on Sunday, extremists linked to Al-Qaeda stormed the regional government offices in the capital, Mogadishu. At least five civilians, as you mentioned, were killed and 16 others were wounded. According to the Associated Press, a staff member at the headquarters said the attack began with a suicide bombing before gunmen entered and exchanged fire with security guards. And let's go to Pakistan, where today tens of millions of people were left without electricity. The country's power ministry says a major breakdown of the national grid caused outages in major cities, where some residents say they were unable to get drinking water because the pumps were powered by electricity. This is the second major electricity outage in the country in less than three months. And while Asia celebrates the start of the year of the rabbit, Hong Kong has taken it to a whole new level where rabbits have become popular pets. They usually live in the tiny city apartments, but when the owners are away, many are left in their own luxury resort. It's called bunny style, where they get regular exercise, parties, spa, spa treatments, and lots of hay. Well, you can say that bunnies in Hong Kong are jumping for joy, guys. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, the life of a pampered rabbit. <laughs> uh, that's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Claudio. We're back with some financial headlines. Abbott Labs is now under a DOJ investigation over the contamination issues that eventually led to last year's baby formula shortage. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us now with that and other news. Silvana, good morning. Lindsay Joe, good morning to you. So, uh, yeah, uh, Abbott Labs has confirmed the Justice Department is investigating the company's baby formula plant in Michigan that was shut down for months last year due to contamination. The closure was a key cause of the nationwide shortage that forced parents to seek formula from doctors, friends and food banks. Production at the factory resumed in June. Abbott is one of just four companies that produce 90% of U.S. formula and the only source for many products for children with allergies, digestive problems, and metabolic disorders. 
A survey of economists says more businesses expect to cut jobs and spend less on expansion for the first time since the pandemic began. The poll by the National Association for Business e Economics is a sign the Federal Reserve's push to raise interest rates is doing its job to slow the economy. But business owners are still concerned the Fed's moves could also potentially tip the U.S. into recession. It now costs more to mail a letter. The price of a first class forever stamp going up by three cents to 63 cents. It's the third increase in just the past 17 months and more hikes are expected. The U.S. Postal Service says the move will help offset the rise in inflation. The agency started selling forever stamps in 2007 when they cost 41 cents. And let me tell you, I have some that I bought. I think Ooh. it was like in 2010. Good. And I don't really use them, though. They're just sitting there. <laughs> I was going to say it was a good investment. Maybe not. I know I'm going to sound old here, but I, all I'm thinking right now is I remember when a stamp cost 29 cents. <laughs> Did you have to walk up both <laughs> yes, ways to get it? To the post office to <laughs> yeah. get them. Yes. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. Sure thing. Well, what's old is new again. A popular relic of the past is seemingly taking a new direction back into the mainstream. As reported by the Wall Street Journal, there's been a steady rise in the sale of paper maps. It is a trend that really kicked off during the pandemic, but has since continued. It's especially popular among younger generations like millennials and Gen Zers. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us from South Florida with more on what's driving this trend. Hey, Sam. <laughs> Hey guys, good morning. Stamps and maps, what is going on here? Now I know Joe and Lindsay, all of us are about from the same generation here. We are, and we know that there was a period before GPS. It just doesn't feel really that top of mind. But I'm holding here a real, actual paper map. And yes, sales are going up. Part of that is art people actually like to frame these to remember where they've been. Part of it, guys, is exploration after COVID. Part of it is experiential and just understanding the world in a way that you can't with a phone or GPS. The parodies on paper maps are almost too perfect. When your grandparents don't know that GPS is a thing. With some TikTokers mocking holiday dads for preferring maps to GPS navs or noting a generational disconnect. Sorry, we don't speak boomer. Even the best movie references to the once cherished directional tools are from the 90s. Look at the number on the top. What is the number on the there top? There are of no map? numbers on the top. There's letters. Oh! Whether clueless. Don't fold the maps. I didn't fold the map. Yeah, well, Kansas is a mess. There's a big crease right through Wichita. Or Twister. But don't sleep on millennials bringing them back into popular culture. I love maps. Oh my gosh, they're so much fun. With business owner Tony Rodono of the map shop in Charlotte trying to pin down the surging appeal. If you simply want to get from point A to point B, by all means, you know, listen to the GPS robot voice. Uh, but if you want to understand the world around you, the robot voice can't help. You know, maps offer context and clues as to, you know, why a place is like it is and how you stand in relationship to the places around you. As the Wall Street Journal points out in a recent piece headlined, forget Google Maps, why paper map sales are booming. A combination of maps as art and the search for a bigger picture from younger travelers has sparked a sizable jump in sales. Great Britain's national mapping agency, Orden Survey, reported 144% pop in 2020 and then a 28% increase the next year. AAA made 123% more maps in 2022 than in 2021. And it's not just the traditional variety drawing interest. Rodano sells raised relief maps, which add elevation and texture from the Sierra Nevada to the Rockies. Yeah, there's plenty of mountain ranges, but the Rockies are significantly bigger than any other mountain range. And I think it a lot of people just don't know that, and you can't understand that with GPS, obviously, and you can't even understand that with a flat map sometimes. So while the learning process around these old gems is ongoing. So you read it like, like left to right? The love for a new, off-the-beaten-path approach to getting around is just starting to grow. Guys, there is another reason why map sales are going up. People simply are spending more time in national parks and remote locations where there's no cell phone service, so they kind of have to use the maps. Now, as far as finding this one right here, I went to seven different gas stations along with our producer, Carlos, here, and a rest stop yesterday. No success. Do you want to guess where I actually found this map? Um, in your glove compartment. Good guess. I, if it was like 10 or 15 years ago, Joe, 100%. <laughs> I found it at Barnes & Noble, wow. which of all places, a bookstore still carries these. But in case you want to know for future reference, they do sell maps. All right. Good to know. 
Welcome back. All you fans of NBC's hit sitcom Parks and Rec, eat your heart out. Actress and former NBC page Aubrey Plaza hosted the latest edition of SNL this past weekend. And wouldn't you know it, Plaza's former Parks and Rec co-star Amy Poehler made a surprise cameo during that monologue and weekend update. You can see here that they reprised their roles. So obviously Aubrey Plaza, April Ludgate, Leslie Nope there, Amy Poehler. Um, and they discussed, wouldn't you know it, working for their local government. <laughs> Love to see that. Oh, and also, we're going to hear a clip, no? Oh, yeah, no. Okay, no. Right. <laughs> we can reenact it for you. Our own Katie Prim Hi. was a page with Aubrey Plaza. We were just talking about it over the weekend, oh, one of our gosh. Today Show producers. And so, you know, there's, there's stories from and back in the day with now. her. And there, look at them now. All right. All right, for the past, for the first time, rather, in seven years, the legendary Eddie Eichel Big Wave Internet Invitational return on Sunday. Yeah, known simply as the Eddie, the single-day competition on Oahu's famed North Shore showcases some of the best big wave riders in the world. And this year, for the first time, it featured women competing in the lineup right alongside the men. For more on this, we are joined by World Surf League commentator Joe Turpel. We're also joined by Mindy Pennybacker, surf columnist for the Honolulu Star Advertising and author of the upcoming book, Surfing Sisterhood Hawaii, Wahini Reclaiming the Waves. Thank you both for joining us. We appreciate having you both. Uh, let's start with you, Joe. I mean, this is not a competition that happens every year in its 39-year history. It's only run 10 times. So for those who don't know, tell us about the Eddie and what it is that makes this competition so significant and why it doesn't always happen every year. Yeah, it's a, it's a really special event. Um, by far, maybe the most prestigious surfing event in the world. It's first of all honors Eddie Aikau, who is a Hawaiian waterman legend. Probably one of the best modern day Hawaiian surfing hero stories that there is. A man that gave his own life to rescue people um, day in and day, day out as a lifeguard, the first North Shore lifeguard, and ended up losing his life rescuing people in a capsized of a hokulea, a Hawaiian uh, sailing canoe back in the late 70s. His whole family put on this event in his honor since he was the lifeguard at Waimea Bay. Uh, he was a world-class surfer and the bay calls the day. That's the, the whole slogan there. If it's not bigger than 20 feet, that's on a Hawaiian scale. For most people, it's 40 foot plus on the face, but the Hawaiians with uh, humility call it a bit smaller than it is, but it's gigantic, 40 to 50 waves. It doesn't run every single winter. And when the bay calls the day, the entire North Shore of Oahu stops what they're doing to come down to watch all the invitees and the big wave heroes go for the most coveted prize. Wow. All right, so Mindy, as we mentioned, this is also the first year women were out competing against the men. How did that come about and how big is that? It's absolutely enormous, Lindsay. As Joe said, this is probably the most prestigious event in surfing and certainly one of the oldest. And the Icaos, Clyde Icao, director of the event in honor of his brother, decided to invite women starting in 2017. It was the first, it's the first major event in which women had been invited to surf alongside men. And this year there were six women in the lineup in possibly what many people said were the biggest and best waves of any Eddie I Cow Invitational in memory. And the women absolutely charged. That is so great to hear. Uh, Joe, you mentioned everyone stops what they're doing. You posted an, a video on Instagram showing the streets lined with cars to watch the Eddie at 1241 Sunday morning. Wow. Here's the thing. Competition didn't start until eight. I mean, what was the <laughs> atmosphere like there on the ground? It, it, to be honest, I was not expecting this. Uh, you know, I go back to the 2016 event. And I don't remember it being this busy and this packed. It had that like a Coachella type atmosphere. People were camping on the side of the streets, preparing for this huge day. They wanted to have the best view uh, surrounding the bay. It's so beautiful. It's like a natural amphitheater. And it was uh, campers hanging out to see something that doesn't happen every year. And they want it. There's even local residents that say, hey, I missed the last one. It's not happening this time. Uh, so it's it's a pretty special thing where everyone just stops what they're doing. You know, all, some of the the local businesses shut down because yeah. they know all eyes are going to be on Waimea Bay. It's really special. Mindy, got to be quick with you here. Tell us about the winner. So 
the winner was Luke Richardson, a life, uh, North Shore lifeguard who actually had to take off time during his work day to surf. And he's only 27 years old. He was absolutely stoked. Um, and I have to say, although none of the women placed, they really made a strong showing in these fearsome waves. I mean, the whole bay was shuddering. And <laughs> all Kayla Kennelly had to say, she's a multiple big wave champion, was right. it was just beautiful out there. <laughs> all right, Joe Trapel and Mindy Pennybacher, thanks for joining us. And after making its Olympic debut in Tokyo, surfing is back in the 2024 Olympics. You can catch Team USA as they go for the gold right here on NBC. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.